Support for this podcast comes from Frito-Lay in the 2023 Snack Bracket Championship. The Frito-Lay Snack It Challenge is underway, and fans are voting on their favorite snacks to crown champion. We're talking about primetime matchups between the best 64 snacks in the land. Will Ruffles Ridges reign supreme? Can Doritos defend their dynasty? Or will Smart Food use their smarts for a surprise upset? Only you can decide. Get in on all the action for a chance to win up to $1,000 or a year's worth of snacks. Let your snacks be heard. Just go to frito to vote and enter for a chance to win. No purchase necessary. Three stakes ends April 3rd, 2023. Void but prohibited. Years worth of snacks awarded in the form of 52 coupons, each good for one bag of chips. See official rules at frito This is the Black and Gold Banneret Podcast. Now, here are your hosts, Jeff Sharon and Eric Lopez. Welcome to the show, Jeff and Eric with you. We have Bryson and Nick joining us here uh, on the Black and Gold Banneret podcast on what's turned into a little bit of a surprising week, uh, uh, especially in basketball service. We'll talk about UCF basketball going to the NIT with a chance to do to the Florida Gators what the football team did also in the postseason, that is beat them. Uh... A little bit of a surprise. We'll talk about how much of a surprise it is with Eric in a little bit. We've also got some baseball and softball news and a little bit of track to catch you up on uh, as well. This will be a pretty short show. So a reminder to follow us at UCF Banner underscore SBN on Twitter, uh, as well as our Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube channels as well. So let's go ahead and uh, dive right in, boys. Eric, so, uh, you know, we come off the heels of the both basketball teams going one and one in the American Athletic Conference uh, tournaments. Of course, the women uh, you know, didn't get, a, you know, got the obviously that's victory in a little bit of an upset in the first round and lost in the second. We go to the men. Uh, they lost to who would be the eventual champions in Memphis. Um which is another story in and of itself. Uh, we can talk about seeding all you want, but we went into a uh, selection Sunday thinking, mm, this is probably it for UCF men's basketball. They were, you know, in the hunt for an NIT bid may have lo- had too many losses to bad, t- to bad teams that might keep them out of the postseason. Then all of a sudden they pop up in the NIT as a five seed playing the fourth seed of Florida Gators, Wednesday night, 7 p.m., ESPN2, UCF at Florida. Um, officially, and I know everyone's going to come at me about this, but officially, UCF has never beaten Florida. Unofficially, UCF has beaten Florida once, and that was in 2010 at the Amway Center. Of course, remember the sanctions on the UCF basketball program that dropped two years after that actually um, wiped that victory, but of course, I think that's stupid, and so do a lot of other people. We watched the game. Um, it, it happened. It's not like it didn't. Um, but nonetheless, this is a chance to do, like we said, what the football team did in the Gasparilla Bowl, and that is beat Florida in the state of Florida in the postseason, Eric. Uh, give me some insight here. How did this all go down, and uh, how much of a surprise Surprise was it that UCF saw their name come up in the NIT bracket? It's very surprising. I mean, you know, I'll give our buddy Noah Goldberg credit. He was the one that's like, hey, you know, can we have a shot? And I'm like, you know, you never say never because the NIT is unpredictable because, first of all, it's a 32-team field. It's not easy to get into. And then one of the criteria is if a team that won the conference regular season title in a one-bid league does not win the conference tournament, they get an automatic bid. Mm-hmm. to the NIT, which I think is a nice gesture. I like that. So you, you don't have 32 spots. You probably usually have, I don't know what the end number ended up this year, was like 23, 24 spots maybe. I don't know. So there's a lot of things. The other thing the NIT does is they go based on net rankings. Uh, now, this is where the NIT bracketologists kind of missed this. This is where we all missed this, and I, I take, I'm talking about myself because uh, I missed this. When I looked at the net rankings for UCF prior to the American Conference rank uh, tournament starting, UCF was in the 90s. They were 93, I believe. You're not getting into the NIT with a 93 NIT. What I failed to do was check the NIT, the, uh, the net rankings as of this weekend. 
UCF jumped 22 spots to 71. They moved how did, up. How did that happen? Was it Memphis? So what well, I, I, it had to have been by virtue of Memphis beating beating Houston because they jumped up Me- quite a bit. Memphis jumped up big, which helped UCF because UCF has that win over Memphis. Also, Oklahoma State jumped in the nets a little bit, which jumped them from a quad two win to a quad one win, which helps UCF because they beat Oak State. Plus, right. I think I think the South Florida losses was upgraded from a quad four to a quad three. This is all like dorky that's nonsense. Tri- that's tri- no, you're but you're right about that. But that matters. That 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 but ended that, up mattering. That contributed to them moving up to seventy one, which put them now on the realm for the NIT. You add a few teams like Dayton and North Carolina didn't get in, but they got in. They got in as well, a five. I think it also helped that Florida's in the NIT as well, because if you notice the NIT bracket, they do try to put geography together, kind of like the Olympic sports. So Florida playing UCF is a nice Let's be fair. It's not that North Carolina didn't get in. It's that they chose not to go. And that's fine. That's (laughs) the right. But and, and, but but, no. but I, yeah, but but I think a lot of fans were like, "Oh, we 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 should send." Somebody said, "Like, oh, we should send North Carolina flowers because they got." No, Actually, that's not the case. That's not the case, right? Because right. there were other teams that had a lower net than UCF that did get in. Correct. The UCF would have been in. I we missed a boat. We didn't check back the net right, and it's tricky. It's a tricky thing because it changes every day, and you don't. You know, it's hard to keep track of the projections. And I think we all did. Drew did. We all think followed the NIT bracketologists and they didn't have UCF in the picture. And I think we just kind of checked out after a while. So uh, let's make a note of this as we move into the big 12 to check the net rankings every day and make sure there's not a big jump. Seriously, because this will not be the last time we probably discuss this in the big 12. So when you look at it from that standpoint, you know, and I think you saw, you found, I give you credit. You found, Someone that actually had UCF in the NIT, right? I think it was Uh, Drew that found that guy. One of you two found that. It was Drew or Noah. It wasn't me. And that sort of, you know, and I remember I tuned in at the first five minutes just to see, all right, let me check it out. Let me see what's going on. And then I see UCF pop up. I'm like, holy bleep. (laughs) He got in. Uh, And I was really happy. I'm happy to be wrong. I'm happy that they got in because I think those players and the coaches deserve to get to the postseason. I mean, we want to get into what an NIT means. We could get into that. I think it's uh, I'm really happy for those guys. They deserve to get a postseason bid. They had a lot of things go against them this year uh, from an injury standpoint, even from a resume standpoint. You know, Florida State, which in October looked like a great win. November, when we beat them at night, it's a great win. It turned out to be a quad four win. Like, even the wins, they didn't get good luck. Even their best win of the year against Memphis in double overtime, they probably it probably hurt them long, moving forward because they probably lost to Tulane, I think, like 48 hours later or something like that. So I'm just happy they get to go to a postseason. I do think that's important for this program. I said this. We both said this in October, November when the season started. To me, for this program, if you make it a postseason, NCAA, great. But if you make the NIT, that's the goal. That's success. And I think the, I'm happy for these guys. They earned it. I don't think they were given anything. Right. Um, this is UCF's third ever trip to the NIT. Third trip it, to the postseason in seven years under uh, Johnny Dawkins. Of course, remember the last time UCF was in the NIT, 2017, they beat Colorado. They won at the one seed, Illinois State, and then beat Illinois at UCF in the most attended game in uh, addition financial arena history. We were there, Eric, right? We were there. I think, if, I think people cared about the NIT, you know, some people trying to dismiss the NIT. Uh, clearly the uh, people cared that year. I well, that. well, they, well, they cared because, uh, for, because of two things. I, I think number one, big opponent. Number two, a trip to M- MSG was on the line. Correct. That was fun. And, you know, that and that fun. was that we, we knew that that would be the last hurrah, no matter what, win or lose. Last UCF, yeah. yeah, it was the, it was the last home game. So you know, and, and we ha- and there was something at stake, something that UCF hadn't done at wow. stake before. And it's one of the greatest moments on campus when you think of on campus UCF athletic moments. And I tweeted this out on Monday. To me, my personal top five, in no particular order, the Mike Hughes kick return against South Florida. I mean, if you were in that building, you you know what I'm talking about. That thing was mm-hmm. electric. Even watching it on TV it was electric. The Trey Neal interception to beat Memphis that got him to the Peach Bowl. The following okay. week. 
two, right? Those two hosting college game day uh, was significant for the university on campus. You and I were there, Jeff, for that. Softball, obviously winning the regional last year, hosting it and winning it was significant. And that moment you just mentioned, the Illinois win. Remember, storming the court. I'll never yeah. forget Johnny Dawkins has got the apple and he's speaking to this crowd around him on the court, saying, we're going to New York. So, I still get chills about that. And uh, it was a special moment. So I always have positive uh, uh, memories of the NIT. And uh, I'm glad, like I said, it, it, that's my top five. And I think for them to get to the NIT for this program, I think is an accomplishment. Uh, and, and I'm excited to see what happens. Who knows what's going to happen? They'll play Florida, which obviously adds a little juice to it. Because uh, these two teams, what, you mentioned the whole NCAA thing, which we'll get into down the road, like how silly it is. And what if the NCAA actually disappeared? Does those records come back? Like, what, can we bring it back? Like, I well, don't even know. Um, I mean, that 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 goes way far afield into like right, right. That's the NCAA I get into administer penalties probably. Sure. But but I, I wanted to get these while, numbers. Right? Well, yeah. Well, let's let's talk about the Gators. So this is UCF and UF's first meeting in men's basketball since 2011 at the O'Connell Center, um, which at the time, lest, lest we forget, UCF was still two years from joining what was then at that time the Big East, is now the American. UCF hasn't played Florida since joining the American. And now we have the chance to play them in, our, in one of our final games before going to the Big 12. Um, about Florida, I wanted to go into that for a little bit too, Eric, because let's let's actually talk about this game. Um, Gators finished sixteen and sixteen, right in the middle of the SEC, nine and nine. Um, they've lost seven of their last ten. Uh, they lost in overtime in their first game of the SEC tournament to Mississippi State, and our friend Matt Dunaway. Um, the uh, Florida went to the NIT last year, went one and one. They lost to Xavier in the second round. Um, they are under a first-year head coach, Todd Golden, who came over from the real USF, which is the University of San Francisco. Uh, and they lost their best player in Colin Castleton, who broke his hand against Ole Miss. Uh, this guy is a Michigan transfer. Uh, and uh, he's their leading scorer and rebounder, and he won't be available. So um, it's funny, we... I have Isn't that uh, a storyline last year with the women's with the women's NCAA game between Florida and UCF wasn't <laughs> uh, yeah it was also the storyline of the football game too and Ryan Ur- uh, Ryan Urquhart from uh, oh, yeah, who, yeah. who does uh, uh, Florida softball on ESPN Plus was is like oh what a coincidence yet again Florida plays UCF mm-hmm. without their best player in another sport but whatever Ryan cry me a river um, this game will be on on national TV ESPN, ESPN two. two. I think, I think this is this could be, and I, I got to give credit to ESPN um, for setting up this matchup because this could be a real intense game. You know, when, when you know, I can see, you know, this thing getting. I, I don't want to get. I don't want to say chippy, but there's, as we know, there's something personal now between UCF and UF, and it's for real, and. Uh, yeah, I, I, I mean, I think this could be a real. This could make for a good environment if you're if you're going to be in the NIT, right? And you're not going to be in the NCAA tournament. This is the kind of game that people are going to tune in to watch. I agree. Think. I agree. I mean, why not? I mean, you. you it, first of all, I mean, the fact that it's 12 years since UCF Florida played at men's basketball is just to me. It's been wrong. I mean, basketball. Now, remember, put it in context. There was years there with Mike White was the head coach for Florida. His brother was Danny White, and Danny White even acknowledged he didn't want to play his brother. Like, that that's just family. So I mean, that's that, fair. That's, some that's of that, fair. Let, let's be fair about that. But, look, uh, Todd Golden's the first-year head coach, as you mentioned, Florida. It was interesting. I read where I think Florida wanted to play in the NIT because they want to keep this postseason streak going, I guess, with their basketball team between NCAAs and NIT, uh, which I think is smart. It makes sense. Um I think it's a fun matchup. Obviously, ESPN agrees because they put it on a marquee slot Wednesday night, ESPN 2. So uh, they feel pretty good about it. Colin Castleton is the kid that you talk, you know, the land Florida fifth year, good big 16 and uh, average of 16.7 boards, 6'11, 250. Could be matched up with Taylor Hendricks. I think, by the way, Taylor Hendricks and well, Johnny no, he, Dawkins, he won't be He won't be matched up because he's out. Would have been. That's what I meant. Would have been, been, yeah, yeah. been a fun matchup. I probably misspoke there. 
Uh, so that, that's going to be interesting who replaces that production from him. You got obviously guys like Will Richard and company. I mean, Florida was up and down. So uh, we'll see how they rally to this game. But it's a fun matchup, and you know we'll see what happens. The winner plays, I guess, Oregon or UC Irvine. Correct. Which plays tips off at about eleven o'clock that night. If UCF were to beat Florida, then you become you probably become big UCF Irvine fans because I think UCF would host in that scenario. I, I mean, we I, don't. I, right? I would believe imagine. that would be the case. Uh, Irvine's uh, nets way lower. Yeah, because uh, well, and also, and also the you know it, it goes to the low the the host is the lower seed unless the higher seed for whatever reason can't host. Interestingly enough, that's what happened when UCF played Illinois because right. Illinois was the two seed, but for whatever reason I can't remember what they couldn't host the game in Champaign, so UCF ended up hosting it and it worked out to their benefit because UCF won by. We appreciated that. Thank you. Yeah, we we want to thank uh, Bruce Weber at the time in Illinois for that. Um, the uh, by the way, there is a line for the game already. Florida's favored by three, <laughs> according to DraftKings Sports. That's pretty funny. That's pretty funny. Uh, it's a good matchup. We'll That's see what happens. Game. What's funny? And we'll see how this goes. We'll see the matchup now. As we record this, Johnny Dawkins will have a media availability uh, ability on Tuesday. Hmm. Uh, so we'll probably get some more details, for example, on the news that Jalen Young, I guess, entered the transfer. Uh, portal, Correct. Which kind of makes it a little awkward. Uh, we'll see if he's allowed to play, won't play, because – I don't know well, how the yeah, rules work on that. I don't. I mean, well, he, kind of- he's he's he hasn't. I mean, he, you can announce that you are entering the transfer portal, but not necessarily but, enter. But he's. But he, it, yeah, the the date is not actually. You know, he's. It, it doesn't. It's it's like it's not open yet, right? So in theory, if Jalen Young just it, it just you know a wanted to and b Coach Dawkins and the coaches were okay with it, he could still play. I wonder if he made that announcement thinking that we wouldn't be in the end. Correct. I definitely mm-hmm. would. I like to think that was a factor, which is pretty funny. And which, we'll, we'll see. Which, uh, you know, we'll but, I mean, you know, which is about, but, but Jalen's also a senior. I think, he, I think his undergraduate eligibility is up. So he's, so he's looking to play elsewhere as a, to get his master's degree, which, which is cool. I, and, and no hard feelings toward, him at all um because he, he i thought he was fantastic for, for stretches this year as as the backup point guard and really carried us i think early in the season when dj was hurt um eric uh, uh, bryson does did want to mention that uh florida still has all freshman sec selection riley kugel i think is from dr phillips if i'm not mistaken uh from, from dr phillips high school um so a little bit of a local flavor this is this is uh yeah, this is this is about as interesting a matchup as there is. And I think actually, I think it is the most interesting. Well, I was looking at well, all, all yeah. 16 first round games. That's some, this is the most interesting one. And now let me ask you this though, before we move on. You know, UCF right now 18 and 14, Eric. Two wins from 20. They would have to, you know, get to the round of eight in order to hit 20 wins. Um you know, I, I always I'm kind of old school. I think winning 20 games matters. Um, but what do you think the narrative is going to be? Um, d- does this selection change the narrative? Does the result against Florida change the narrative? Because I because I'll tell you the truth. Like I think back to that Gasparilla Bowl. I know it's football. It's different than men's basketball, but um, that win over Florida changed the zeitgeist around UCF sure. football heading into that off season. Does the same apply here? I think regardless of the result, this is a successful season. You may I agree season. with you, but you know, not everyone it, agrees with us as we both know. Well, it goes back to how you feel about the NIT, but my argument is here's my argument for those that like the bowl game system that likes the bowl games, like the Gasparillas, the uh, what bowl game we played again this year, military, whatever. Um, If you like those bowl games, you better like the NIT. What I don't like are the people that love these bowl games but trash the NIT. Because to me, they're the same. They're postseason games. Uh, Do we probably put too much stock in it? Probably sometimes we do. I I do agree with that. Uh, But I don't like the people that are critical of the NIT that are big bowl fans. You can't be bowl. In my opinion, either you like both or you don't. That's where I stand on that. Uh, For this program, different than football, I think – 
I said this to make it in a postseason tournament of any kind, NIT. I want to say specifically NIT, NCAA. I don't like the CBI. I didn't like that we had to pay that one year. Where well, I guess it doesn't count anymore, according to the NCAA. We never did join the CBI, did we? Did we? Are, did we count that? I don't even know. What, whatever the NCAA thinks. I um, was listen. I was I, I was there. I was underneath the basket running the camera. The yeah. games happen. Trust me. Anyway, no, no. But what I'm saying, I don't like the CBI because you actually literally have to pay to get in. Like, right. Is that, and that's but that's one that's actually held in Daytona, right? Now it's held in Daytona. By yeah, like, they, held, they held it all across like five days in in Daytona, which is one wild. thing. By the way, the NIT Final Four is no longer at Madison Square Garden. It's now in Correct. Las Vegas. Right. Which, hey. Well, um, they, well, you know what they did? They they started putting it out for bids now. Yes. Just like just like the fight, because as tradition, like you said, since by the way, I can't even believe this when I looked it up. Since 1938, the NIT has been held in Madison Square Garden, and this is the first. Right. And this is the first year. It actually predates the NCAA tournament, correct? Uh, and is now uh, the, it's going to be in Las Vegas this year. I think I forget it's somewhere else, somewhere else. I think in. Other places, right? Uh, so, so it's, like- it's somewhere else. The deck, right? I think it goes out for bids now. It's a, it's a bummer because it's not like, oh, we're going to go to the garden. Well, actually, no, we're not. But, uh, but no, I don't think, yeah, but, a trip so to I, Vegas ain't bad. <laughs> so I think this makes it a good season, which I, I think it's a good season to make the NIT. If they beat Florida, then I'll make this claim that I think men's basketball actually had a better season in football if they beat Florida. Ooh, Ooh. that's my claim. That's a hot take. Thank you. I'm not going to lie. That's why I wanted that is, Kyle here. I was ready to punch That is a flaming hot take. Thank you. Bro, I, I might All write right. about that. I might actually write about that if we win. I might write well, that. we'll find out Wednesday, uh, 7 p.m. Uh, on Real quick, ESPN on the court, two. let's get into on the court. We haven't talked, in, uh, obviously, the conference tournament and moving forward. So I do think this is a factor. C.J. Kelly was fantastic in the conference tournament. And I thought oh, was what was. was interesting was, especially in the second half of the games, you saw that the offense – was starting to be run through with C.J. Kelly, not Darius Johnson. Kelly, who came in as really a two-guard, and Johnny Dawkins even told, said in the postgame, you know, told me throughout the season, they want him to be run as a point and as a two, be more of a combo guard. That paid off for them. They don't mm-hmm. win the SMU game without C.J. Kelly running the offense in the second half. And I thought he kept them in the game. So I wanna, I'm really the happiest for him. That guy deserves to play in a postseason game. And I'm curious in the Florida game, you know, if Darius gets off to a slow start like he did against Memphis where he turned the ball over and struggled, do we see that continuation with C.J. Kelly maybe running the point, running the offense against Florida, especially with the Jalen Young situation? So that's something to look for on the court. And also UCF, which, you know, can they defend rebounding? I thought, you know, in the first the SMU game, they did not come out ready to in the, in the glass. They got beat up in the first half. Since then, they did a nice job in the glass. The Memphis game, they just ran into two red-hot players. Uh, that was a high-level performance by those guys, and they proved it uh, by winning the conference title against Houston. Yeah. So those Houston, are I thought they beat Houston rather handily, too. They I, did. I, Houston uh, had no Henry answer. Davis and Williams are two fantastic players. Uh, me and Kyle debate about this, and again, he's not here to defend himself. He thought UCF didn't defend as well against Memphis. I just give credit to the players. I thought Williams and, and Davis were fantastic. I think they had an indefensible night. I think that's I what was, I'm saying. Yeah, yeah. yeah. They, they you know, there are some nights, and and like I hear, you know, I I saw everything on social media. Everyone was like, "Why do we make an adjustment?" I'm like we were making adjustments. It wasn't going to matter. The, there are nights in basketball where a, a guy or two guys. They are going to, if they decide they're going to own you, they're going to own you. It's kind of, you know, we used to hear this all the time with Jordan, right? Like, you know, what, you know, and, and I'm not saying Kendrick Davis is Michael Jordan, but he had a Jordan esque night that night against us um, where we just weren't going to stop him. And they make big shots too. Every time UCF came in, it was a really yep. high entertaining game. Give them credit. I tipped my cap to them uh, on that, and Memphis deserved the game. So those are a couple things to watch in this game. And Taylor Hendricks, who had a tough night against Memphis. You know, gets another game. I'm curious another how he comes out yeah. against Florida. So that's sort of some of the things on the court to watch uh, Wednesday night here against Florida. Yeah, and I, at a point about C.J. Kelly, I think what you saw, and, and you know, coaches have talked to me, and I'm sure they've talked to you about the same thing. There's something about a conference tournament, you know, where you can – where suddenly, you, you know, older uh, – seniors especially are confronted in a very real way with their sports – mortality if you will um and 
the real the real seniors who have like we like to say that dog in them like CJ does I think turn it up another level or two or five and I think we saw that with CJ and that's a good thing about the NIT because you know now all of a sudden you know sometimes the se- the season when if it ends in the conference tournament it's so final that you suddenly realize that oh my god you know the younger guys I think are like oh my god the season's already over well now you get another shot right it's like you get an extra it's like you get a continue in a video game right. and what kind of you know now what are those young guys going to do to try and extend the basketball careers of those seniors CJ Kelly Michael Durr etc I think that's that's worth you know that that's I would like to see that from our team. I have no reason to suspect that we won't see that, but um, that's going to be one of the key things to see on Wednesday, 7 p.m. ESPN. Do we know who's uh, calling that game yet, Eric, or no? Don't know that yet. I'll tweet it out as soon as I find out. Oklahoma State, the number one overall seed, I believe, in the NIT, too, by the way, uh, from the Big 12. So who knows? Maybe uh, get a rematch. Cincinnati's, Cincinnati's in the uh, NIT, Cincinnati's too. in. It's interesting. Some people wondering, you know, did that help? The fact that those teams are going to the Big 12, did that help them there? No, I don't think so. I think there's just more net rank. Although Cincinnati was weird. Didn't hurt. West, <laughs> didn't hurt. West Miller first came out said we weren't going to play in the NIT, and then I guess they are, so. Well, there you are. But hey, well, um, I think, again, I think this is cool. Let's have fun with it. Don't try to microscop it. Let's watch, see what happens in the game. And I'm just happy they made the postseason, which is something we don't get often in men's basketball historically. Hey, all right. Hey, yeah. Uh, and hey, listen, whatever happened, I don't care. I don't even care whatever happens after that. We beat Florida. You know, uh, <laughs> I'm sticking to my hot take. If they beat Florida, it's a better season in football. Yeah, I, I mean, it's – you beat Florida, you can brag all you want. You know? In fact, if they, the beat that's Florida, if they beat Florida, you can argue it's similar basically to the year one of football with Gus when they beat Florida. Yeah. It's a very similar storyline, very similar. Hey, you beat Florida in basketball? Emily Bannister, this one goes out to you. <laughs> right? Update the background. Wow. Update the background. I'll do it. Hey, why not? So, all right. Um you know, we talked. I wanted to touch upon women's basketball real quick as we finish up. Uh, they lost to Memphis to close out uh, their season in the NCAA. Obviously, they're not going to the NIT. Um, but let's kind of put a early triage on the season right now, Eric. You know, they finished. Uh, it, it, it was such a difficult year, considering you know it, it was almost like snake pit from the start with all the players who left. 14 and 15 final record, four and 11 in the league. Um, won three of their final five uh, and won a game in the conference tournament, which uh, against Tulsa, which, you know, they were the 10, Tulsa was the seven. That counts as an upset, beat them by 16 points. Um, had a shot against Memphis. Did everything they needed to defensively in order to get the job done, but just came up short 48 46. Um, in the end, what's what's the final analysis? Or I say, I, let me say the triage right now for UCF women's basketball. As you know, it, it, yeah, I mean, let's let's be honest with you. It's a it's a fall from grace compared to the previous season. But given all the changes that happened, I think, and this is my personal opinion, to rally and get a postseason win in the conference tournament, even though it's the one win, you know, you hang on to the positives that you can from a season from a season like this one they and they had they had their share of injuries no doubt chemistry issues that they were working for a lot of new faces getting together but if you're Satya Messer I think you hang your hat on that postseason when you say hey look at least we can we have some foundation on which to build here no well remains to be seen we got to see how the roster will look like next season they're you know we're, we spent a ton of time talking about the men's basketball in the future and how they're going to compete in the Big 12 and finances and, and, and resources and all that. Women's basketball has got the same problem, Jeff. <laughs> Let's not act like they, women. They have, they, have, they, have, they have even larger problems in that respect. Uh, right. So I think that's the bigger picture, more so than what this short-term year is uh, from that standpoint. You know, I mentioned the conference tournament. But the thing that kind of hurts there is you had a double-digit lead against Memphis. You hold on to that game. You're in the semis against East Carolina in a tournament that became wide open when South Florida went one and right. done. So that right. stings a little bit. But the Memphis game in a lot of ways was kind of the story of the season, right? You saw yeah. some promise, had a league, couldn't hold it, et cetera. But 
you know, and then ECU goes on and wins the whole thing. And then ECU wins the big, you know, to them. They were picked last, by the way, in the preseason poll. <laughs> Go figure. But I think the bigger story for women's basketball, I think goes beyond just this year, is what are they going to do in the Big 12? What is that going to be? That's going to be a hard transition for them, too. So what is that roster going to look like? A Big 12 that's still going to be very strong, but still going to have Oklahoma and Texas, who are the co-Big 12 champions. For at least another year, you got the Baylors of the world. Yeah, you got Texas Tech. So it's a you're going from a league that was a ninth, eighth, ninth, tenth conference to the top four conference in women's basketball. So what are the challenges for Cynthia Messer, who knows that league? Obviously, can you get those right players? Can you compete? How long does it take before you adjust to that Big 12? I think there are similar questions to women's basketball than the men's side. We just haven't talked about it enough. And I know that you guys are we're, we're trying to see if we'll make, get Coach Messer down the road. I'm sure those are questions that Kyle, I know, has for Coach. Um, so I'm that's, to me, my thing is moving. How is the outlook in the Big 12 with what kind of players? Because they could probably be a little young, too. They're probably going to lose some players for various reasons on the roster because that's just the way college athletics is today. So obviously you have a players coming in but you're going into a really a, a, a different level of a conference in basketball. That's the big question. Yeah. I, it's they, to me have the biggest mystery kind of surrounding them. Right now. Maybe out of it, maybe out of any program I heading into the big 12. Yeah. It's like, we don't really know what's going to happen there. Um, you know, and like you said, you know, now we're going to be entering into transfer portal season. We don't know what's going to happen there. Um, the recruiting, obviously, the indications that we've been getting from Coach Messers that she's bringing in some serious players, um, you know. But you know, but but again, it's you know, I don't think you'd ever hear from a coach that like, eh, recruiting's not going so. Well. You know what I mean? <laughs> like, right. No. Well, and I'm curious from her standpoint. <laughs> so, I'm wondering from her when she reflect when she takes a step back. Could here. you imagine, by the way? Yeah. I'm sorry to interrupt, but could you imagine, yeah. by the way, any head coach like if any head coach in any sport, if we asked them about recruiting, they'd be like. Uh, you know, it's a rough year out there. We're we're not we're not really recruiting. We're having, we're having no, a bad we'll, year. we'll do We've we'll do better. Luck. Yeah, we'll do better next year. We'll do better uh, next. That'd year. be a first. That would be a first. <laughs> Everybody's a great recruiter. Could you imagine? It would be a little different. I'm not sure they would be lasting as a coach, probably. But that's you know who knows. Um, <laughs> but I do think would, just based on the honesty, it'd be <laughs> great. Anyway. It would be refreshing. Uh, but I do wonder when she takes a step back this season, this off season, what she will think about her first year. Cause remember this was her first year as a head coach in a while. I know mm-hmm. she was a head coach before, but she has been an assistant under Kim bulky for a while. Uh, I'm curious how she felt about herself as a first year head coach and what adjustments does she make in year two from herself? Uh, Cause every coach does that in their first year. Uh, I'll use Sydney ball Malone as an example. She, you know, she did certain things in the first year and she reflected on it. I was like, you know, I, let me just do this differently in year two. I think mm-hmm. every coach is like that. So I'll be curious mm-hmm. as she reflects on this year, what she will look internally and say, you know, what could I, what did I learn from this and handling all the stuff that I had to handle and what areas do I, can I improve as well as bringing in players, but what can I do? What can our staff do also? What did we learn? Cause this was our first year together. So I think that's a big, interesting plot line uh, to, to, for them. They're moving forward as well. Yeah, I think one of the things that, you know, you and I like to talk about a lot is like, what is a team's identity? Yeah. And the one thing that I thought was really encouraging about the team, especially later on in the year, was they rebound, man. They were actually one of the top schools in the nation in rebounding. I want to, I'll double check the stats on that. But like, we talk all the time about the importance of, rebounding in in you know in in both sides of basketball like you don't rebound you don't win um this team did rebound the ball extraordinarily well the, the, the problem was offensively they just really couldn't make shots uh especially when they needed to this year they were i got the number right here they were uh where was the rebounding numbers it was right i, I had it there for a second oh Ninth in the country in rebounds per game. 11th in the country in offensive rebounds per game. 18th in the country in field goal percentage defense. They held opponents to 36%. That is where you can build an identity, no? 
Could be. I mean, Houston's done that on the men's side, but you mentioned you make a good point. They did, they struggled to shoot the ball, and I thought the times – they were undisciplined in some of their shooting, the three-point shot. I'm like, Louis, you know, why not go inside yeah. more when you have some, you know, it's like a Destiny Thomas and things like that. So, uh, But, that, but that, I, yeah. I think that's that's hard to do under a first-year coach, right? Learning no, that's, my, that's really, my point. That's, right, right. Yeah. And that's my point. That's part of the learning curve, right? The transition there. Like the third quarters, they struggled a lot in the third quarters. What went into that? They'll evaluate that throughout the offseason. Uh, from that standpoint, so that that is part of it. I think she and I, you know, I think she would like to tell you that that's part of it, being the glass, being physical, and you're going to have to do that when you get into the Big Twelve. That's yeah. probably she knows that as well as anybody. Yeah, and you talk about offensive field goal. We talk about defensive field goal percentage. Um, you see up being uh, God, I had it there. Oh yeah, 18th in the country. Well, offensive field goal percentage, they were 342nd, 34 percent, and it's not going to get it done. But nope. again. That comes, you know, learning where and how good shots can be taken. That takes time, and that takes uh, that 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 just takes reps. And we're hopefully to see a lot more reps in the future uh, for this team. But at least they've established their defensive identity, and they've established their rebounding identity, and that's key. All right, we're going to take a break. When we come back, we'll bring in Bryson and Nick, and they're going to talk. And we're going to talk a little baseball. We're going to talk a little softball. Oh, track news. Renaya Jones, at the indoor nationals in the NCAA. How did she fare? And a few more things uh, to pick up as well. Stick around. We'll be right back. This is the Black and Gold Pattern Podcast. Today's episode is brought to you by Cars.com. With over 2 million vehicles and 50,000 more added every day, Cars.com will match you with the perfect car for you, your budget, your life, your style. And if you're ready to say goodbye to your current car, Cars.com will get you an instant offer to cash it in. Just start by entering your license plate and get matched with a local dealer who will write you the check. So whether you're looking to buy or sell, just go to Cars.com. It's magical. We're back here on the Black and Gold Banner at Podcast. Jeff Sharon, Eric Lopez, alongside Nick Porcelli now and Bryson Turner joining us on the show. And we're going to talk uh, first about UCF softball, uh, Eric Lopez. Let's get an update from you on where this team is right now. And Nick, you were there too as well. Um, RPI right now is 68, not ideal, uh, considering how um, although they have won five in a row this week after that three, nothing loss to Florida back, uh, five days ago, two wins over Toledo, two wins over Kennesaw state, one win over North Dakota, only one of those games that they give up more than one run Two shutouts were worked into that. And Eric Lopez, I'm looking at this team right now. They are real trouble on the base pass for opponents. They're 25th in the country in triples per game. That tells me have a, that tells me speed. They're, uh, they're, even though they don't steal a lot of bases, um, we know that when they put the ball into play, they're a problem. And I think that – did we sort anything out this week that needed sorting out? Especially, I know you've talked a lot about in the past, the pitching staff. Are we well, going to talk a lot to- of pitch- – We're going to talk a lot of pitching with both teams with the uh, bat and ball because that's going to be a big concern. Well, well, that's there, yeah. yeah, but it, 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 is it are we closer to an answer on UCF softball in the circle? I think we're getting close. Uh, you know, I think, you know, Sarah Willis has thrown really well the last week. Pitched a shutout against Fresno in California. Gets a good win against Toledo. Pitches a one hitter against Kennesaw. Grace Jewell threw a shutout against Toledo. Now, yes, the competition, not top 25 quality. But sometimes you got to get some confidence back. And the thing I did like is they finally was, you know, not walking hitters, which has been a significant problem for this program, uh, the staff, young staff early in the year. And their whip, I mean, look at their whip for the season, even with the good weekend, they're still at 148, I believe, in the whip, uh, 148, which is way too high uh, on the whip. So hopefully, I think they're starting to find some answers there. Jewel is stepping up. Willis, I think, is definitely stepping up. And then offensively, we've kind of let them off the hook a little bit. Because you mentioned those stats, they kind of got back to being more diverse offensively this week. And even talking to Coach Paul Malone, she said one of the problems they had is they hit so many home runs early in the year that they that, that was actually a bad thing. Because what happens is, and you know this, Jeff, uh, and I like the Yankees. So this is not a knock on the Yankees. Uh, I think this you would agree as a Yankee fan. One of the problems I've had with, and I've argued with our friend Brian Murphy about this, 
the Yankee teams recently of Aaron Judge and Stan, they fall in love with the home run, right? So what happens when they run into a team like the Astros and the Astros don't give up homers? They can't score runs elsewhere. They yeah. depend too much on the I mean, long you, ball. You, 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 yeah, I mean, you can depend on the long ball in the regular season, but once once stuff right. gets real, yeah. you got to figure out how to manufacture runs. Right. And that's and you're right. right. And softball is running that. They ran into that problem where they thought they were a home run hitting team. And and they that's why they struggled on the West Coast. They were trying to hit home runs instead of just putting the ball in play, which is really the identity of a Coach Ball Malone run offense is put the ball in play, hit gaps, put pressure on the defense, run a little small ball, mix it up. And then we saw that this weekend for the first time. So I think they're getting their identity back. I think they lost – their offense lost their identity when they hit so many homers. They thought they were a home run hitting team. They can hit the home run, but that's not who they are. And to your point – they haven't stolen many bases because they were trying to play for the long ball. Now they're getting back to that. So that's all positive. That being said, they host Rutgers, obviously, Tuesday, and then they go to Stillwater where they will take on the number two ranked team in the country, Oklahoma State, future Big 12 rival, yeah. uh, and Arizona State of the Pac-12. So that's going to be a test, and that's going to be their final test before conference starts. So let's see where they're at, but I do think they're making uh, – they're, move, they're progressing. The question is, are they progressing fast enough? Because I think the deadline here is you've got to have everything ready to go for conference because Wichita State's the opener series. That's a monster series. That could decide the conference. That's, that's been the two best teams in the league for the last uh, two years, really, going on yeah. three years. They're probably going to be. So uh, we'll see. Let me ask you about these, these, these seven games coming up. Rutgers doubleheader on Tuesday. Uh, and then – Five games out in Stillwater, like you said. Three against Oklahoma State. Two against Arizona State. This is now the kind of competition that you're going to start seeing week in and week out in the Big 12, at least the level. Is this a fair comparison to what we're going to start seeing starting next year, given where Rutgers, Oklahoma State, and Arizona State are in the college softball hierarchy, at least at the moment. Well, I think this whole non-conference schedule is. And, you know, because so many people have been asking me, well, do do you think Coach Ball Malone regrets that she scheduled too hard with this young staff, right? Because you mentioned the RPI and they're 15. The reason their RPI is as high as it is, it's not because of the schedule. They've played a good schedule. The problem is they haven't won those games. (laughs) you got to win those. you got to win some. Uh, they're one in nine, I think, in, in uh, quad one wins. God, I know people are sick of that term, quad, but that's, you know, it is what it is. Um, I think unfortunately, I just hurt my quad. Anyway, there you mm-hmm. go. Unfortunately, they've lost. You realize they've lost three quad one games on walk offs? Think about that. Think about wow. this. If they win those three games, that sounds like gonna... men's basketball losing games on buzzer beaters. Well, you laugh, but softball's had, had kind of a similar season to men's basketball as far as losing close games. They've lost five games this year via the walk off. To put that in perspective, from 2019 to 2022, they only lost two games via the walk-off. Think about that's that's and insane. those are those are non-run rule walk-offs, right? Non-run rules, correct. In fact, I looked over I uh, over all the years I've been to, we've never lost this many games on a walk-off in a year, let alone oh. first month or two. So they've been a little unlucky, uh, but some of that is because of the young pitching and the walks that we've talked about. But yeah. no, I don't think they regret. Uh, the, the scheduling the way they did because first of all they could still with if they finish strong and do well in conference I think they'll be in the tournament I think the hosting thing is probably out the window at this point unless they were to sweep Oklahoma State and get really hot but I think the other reason why I don't I don't think they regret it is and Coach Bob Malone said this you got to get used to this in Power Five world now this is what it's like is playing tough teams every week it's yeah, a, it's battle. a grind and it's a grind so man I, I think these players because there's a lot of them will be back for next year. They'll be used to this by the time they get into the Big 12. And I think she likes the fact they're going to Stillwater this year because of that, because they're going to play Oklahoma State three games next year anyway. They're playing them three times this time. So what? We're going to play them next year. We better get used to it. So I think she likes this, not just for this year, but moving forward. Eric, is there a Ken Palm of softball that we should consult? <laughs> uh, I think so. Yeah, does... is pretty much it, though. Well, Sagarin does some of those stuff. I mean, I give Ken Palm credit. He goes very in-depth as far as the stat that Kevin Brown gave us from ESPN, that UCF men's basketball is the fourth unluckiest team in the country, which that's incredible. Think about it. There's 360-some schools. We're the fourth unluckiest, which I'm happy that Ken Palm does that because it kind of backs up our point. Because when we say that, you know, some people might say, oh, you're just making excuses. You're being – no, it's a fact. This men's basketball has been unlucky. It is is a fact, but it's almost – you know, with them, it was almost like – 
I don't need some sort of t- statistic to tell me that, you know. I mean, I right. saw we saw the games, but no, we saw so, how unlucky they were in close right. games this year. So softball doesn't have that in depth, but having five—I mean, my own—I I guess I am Ken Palm. Five mm. walk-off losses. Ah, you switch that. We're having a completely different conversation. It's an enormous amount of walk. If you flip off-off. half of them, or if you flip that's like all, two, that's of all them. I'm saying. Two right? or three. We're having a totally different conversation. So right. That's awful. Uh, what's the TV schedule? You got both the Rutgers games? Got ESPN Plus Rutgers Tuesday with uh, Jamie Lowe Price, and then I want to say Oklahoma State will put their games against UCF on ESPN Plus. I don't think they are for Arizona State, so we may have to do the tracker for that. <sighs> Pac-12. Oh, well. What are they going to do? Put it on? Hey, hey, hey! Think about it. You laugh, but think about this: Oklahoma State, Arizona State could be two future Big Twelve conference series, depending on how real next few months go in the Pac-12. Right? Uh... Hey, hey. Never know. This could that's be the those, future. That's one of those conversations we got to hold on to until June the 30th, right? I'm just saying, this could be the f- future Big 12 weekend, right? All right. All right. Uh, let's get, Di- uh, let's get uh, Bryson in here. I almost said Dyson to clean things up. Bryson to clean things up here about uh, UCF baseball. Um, snake bit for the second straight uh, uh, weekend in terms of getting the win on Friday and then losing the Saturday and Sunday games. And for the second consecutive week, UCF had a game where they gave up double digit runs in the first inning. They did that in the Saturday game against Troy after the five, three win on Friday, they lost 12 to three and then five to four. And and on uh, what one, well, at least I saw it was an extremely controversial call. I think to say the least that gave, Troy, it's uh, it's winning margin, but um, uh, we did see some mystery with Ben McCabe hitting his 40th career home run. And just to give everybody an idea of what UCF is doing right now, you Eric, you talked about relying on the long ball too much. Well, UCF baseball has been relying on the long ball quite a bit in this early stage. They're 10 and five right now, by the way, overall, and they're fifth in the country in home runs per game at 2.33. Uh, and 18th in the nation in slugging percentage. But uh, Bryson, this, we've talked about the story of this week. They have two games coming up against Florida State and a three-game set against Dartmouth at home. Um, where are they right now? And aside from the obvious, which is not giving up 10 runs or more in the first inning, what do they need to fix? Well, I'll tell you this. You You may laugh when I say this, but I think overall the pitching this year was actually better than last week and this is why so you know that so all right all right let's let's hear this let's hear this hot take go okay so in the game that we gave up 10 runs in we had chase and Hala starting on the mound that is not the same pitcher that gave up that that gave up 10 runs last time that was the last time that was ben that ben vesley dom stagliano so this is a, a completely different pitcher now does this now? Does this mean that we got to make sure that every pitcher gets this? Yes, but I want want to look at the, the improvements of Rudy Gomez and Cameron Leiter because both of their pitching performances th- this season were very much in pr- better over last time. Rudy Gomez got career highs in inning in innings pitched and str- and strikeouts. Very well done on his part in Friday's win. And then Cameron Leiter went four innings and allowed five hits, three runs, th- three runs, three walks, seven strikeouts. A little, little bit of a walk and stern still on my part for him, but a much better performance than last week where he only went 1.2 innings and gave up six runs on six hits. So lighter. So as far as, as from last week to this week, I actually think the pitching is a little bit better because light, uh, of course, lighter is improved. We saw Nick Vieira get career highs in, re- in relief. Although Greg Lovelady mentioned that pitching while you're down 10 nothing is a lot easier than when the game is closer. So maybe <laughs> yeah. we can that with <laughs> uh, uh, Nadia Victor, by the way, came in relief, actually had a pretty solid game, pitched three innings, only allowed one run and, and uh, only allowed one hit and two unearned runs. Those two those runs you talked about were unearned. You can't really blame Nadia, blame Nadia Victor for that. So Victor had a really good re- relief performance. And Kyle Kramer came in twice and did really well picking up the save in that first win. So I would, so the, I think the pitching 
is improving. I just we just need to make sure that Chase and Tala, Ben Vespi, Dom Sagliano, I think one of these guys just needs to be able to get it to get get it together and fill that third rotation spot because Rudy Gomez and Cameron Leiter, I think, pretty much have their starting rotation spots locked down. It's all about who is going to be that third pitcher. And we've and I've said this so many times, pitching depth is what is going to win you big games late in the season. So so that's something we're going to need moving forward moving forward. The defense is really what killed us as far as losing the series, because in that Sunday game, we had five errors, five that I'm sorry. That's just unacceptable. Ben, not great, Bob. Not, no, it is not. Um, those last two runs that lost us the game on Sunday and subsequently the series, the, the series were because of errors. So I don't And then of course we couldn't, we couldn't manufacture runs either. Only Ben McCabe and John Rice Plumley were able to hit it out of the park the whole time. Yeah. So I would, so I would just argue that John Rice Plumley actually said it really well and go watch his postseason uh, post game on the black and gold banner at YouTube channel. They need to play better team baseball where the fielding, the pitching and the offense all are able to align at once and all have a good game because so far we haven't really had that this season and so i think going forward that's what they're going to need to do is really try to align themselves a lot better so that way they're better they're uh, better performing holistically as a team and they're going to need that because florida state is another high rpi opponent so uh you mentioned florida state who comes in with that early rpi of 16 um they got off to a a 6-0 start this year uh took two of three at tcu uh, uh, and just took two of three uh, against Pitt uh, to actually, they've already opened uh, ACC play uh, over this past weekend. So these two games coming in against UCF, um, you know, Florida State, they, they caused trouble on the base pass too, 12th in the country in doubles per game, at least as of right now. Uh, and their pitching right now is so far not too bad. 4.08 team ERA is 39th in the country. And then, you, uh, you know, and then obviously you have Dartmouth coming in after that. Um, Dartmouth has, they don't even play a home game until April Fool's Day, which is hilarious. But um, they, uh, because they're a Northern team, they have to do that whole Southern swing thing. They played at Miami. They're playing at South Florida this week um, at UCF and then, you know, at Jacksonville. Um, but uh, they are 0 7 at least so far. Uh, on the year UCF has three games coming up against them obviously you want to dominate Dartmouth over the course of the weekend gotta win a weekend series Jeff I mean we can this is a the, the, the under the that we're burying the lead here they lost this weekend series after winning the Friday night game for the second weekend in a Again, row yeah and that's been a you know college baseball they look at that much more closer than softball that you gotta win an RP uh, a weekend series weekend series are critical uh and, you know, what Bryson's saying, yeah, they pitched a little better. They gave up 10 runs in the first inning for the second week in a row. That Greg's was a loves- different picture, though, Eric. No, it doesn't matter. No, but here's the problem. Here's the problem. Their staff for the year, ERA, 5.35. Yeah, 5.35. 1.4. It. You're not, you're not going to beat it. You're not going to make the tournament with a staff like that. Now, can it get better? Sure. But there's a lot of issues. Cam Leiter's got to get more control. He's walking too many guys. He only went four plus innings. Will that get better? He's a young kid. He's a freshman. Who is going to step into that role? You know, we don't know. There is no right now Colton Gordon on this staff. There is no Hunter Patterson. I mean, Greg was even outspoken in the post game. They got to figure it out. Anybody's it's fluid. He called it and described it as fluid. The pitching staff. And he's right. Yeah, he's right. That's well, got to get better because you can't depend on your offense to bear to carry you all year round. Because at some point, you know, you're going to run into good pitching. Uh, and unfortunately, you got to win these weekend series if you want to make it to the NCAA. You got to win weekend series if you got to be in the mix for the conference championship and, and challenge East Carolina. And we, the offense is great. Nobody can complain about the offense. The defense thing, that's a one game. You know, that's going to happen. I, I don't, yeah. I think they've played good defense all year, but they've got to get better, consistent pitching from their starters on the weekends. That's just, it just is what it is. Yeah. That's rough. Uh, and but, I can relate. You, know, you split. Hey, you split with Florida State. Sweep Dartmouth. Sure. We're singing a different tune this time next week, right? And well, and they got Maryland after that, which is again a big test. That's a team that many believe can win the uh, challenge for the Big Ten title. And uh, before you know it, the American Conference State starts. So they got a few weeks to figure this out. 
Who it is it? Who's going to step into those roles? Mm. That's still the biggest question for this team. All right. Um, I wanted to flip over to uh, track and field real quick, Bryce. And Renia Jones was the only UCF uh, athlete in the NCAA indoor track and field championships in the 60 meter hurdle. She didn't get to the final, but um, what's the just real quick? What's the story? You know, how did that all go down at uh, at Albuquerque this past weekend? So I took uh, watching that they actually false started like two, uh, like two times, which I was like incredulous about, like, how do you do that that many times? But yes, Renaya ended up, ended up, ended up finishing 12th overall. She was, she was awarded second team all America status. So she is once again, given all America honors again, as she's going into that in her second heat, she actually, uh, she ended up finishing fifth behind Masai Russell. And look, the indoor track and field championship is I would say what the toughest NCAA championship to make it into, if only because they don't have a, it's not a lot of people, <laughs> they, right. They don't have like a, pr- a prelim like they do in the outdoor season. It's just, you gotta be one of the top people in the country just to get, get in the door at Albuquerque. Yeah. And Renaya was able to do that. And she ended up getting still get, end up getting second team all America honors because of her finish. It, which overall was 12th with an eight, eight point one six. Was it her fastest time of the year? No, but I think Renaya has in indoor Renaya is still up there. But even when she was on her on a little bit of a down year, because remember last year she had that seven point nine time. This time around, even when she was a little down, she was still one of the best in the country. And so as she turns the page now to outdoor, we go to where we first found her. And I I, I honestly think she's more of an outdoor runner anyway. All right, so we'll keep an eye on Renaya. A uh, couple of things actually happened. I want to get this out real quick before we go to the XFL too. World Baseball Classic. We actually have two UCF Knights competing. Darnell Sweeney, you'll remember, played in the, I believe, was it the Rooney era? Eric? Yeah, I believe he was so. part of that 20, Yeah, he was part of the 2012 team that uh, was within one win away of going to the Super Regionals and winning the Coral Gables Regional. Right. Uh, last played in the majors in 2018, but he is playing for Team Great Britain in the uh, World Baseball Classic. Uh, and I was actually looking up his stats. He's actually having a pretty good WBC. He's four for 10 at the plate, so hitting 400 so far. Uh, a couple doubles, uh, one RBI. So that's awesome to see. Uh, and then I also, uh, well, not quite as successful, but still noteworthy for Team Israel, uh, is uh, Colton Gordon, uh, who uh, got the start, uh, but you know, didn't o- only lasted one inning uh, in his uh, in his lone WBC outing, gave up uh, four runs on four hits uh, and two walks for uh, Team Israel in uh, in his most recent. I forget. Uh, I forget who that was against, um, uh, uh, Bryson. Did you see who that was against? I forgot. But um, in uh, in the WBC, who uh, who Colton was pitching against. But anyway, that's neither here nor there. Um, kind of a bummer to see that go down. But hey, nonetheless, you know it's pretty cool to see two former UCF players playing in the World Baseball Classic. And I really like the WBC. I think it's amazing television. For no other reason than, like, I think that sports is the best and probably only place where nationalism is good. Uh, It was against Puerto Rico. Thank you. And you see how much it means for each of these players to complete, to compete for the countries that they represent, man. It's it's pretty intense out there, right, Eric? It could be. Um, Had I known Darnell Sweeney had you know, ties to Great Britain. I would have asked him when he was a player. Uh, good. But I mean, happy to see Colton Gordon, Colton Gordon healthy uh, as well. Yeah. Pitching there. But, you know, it's a fun little event. Um, I'm trying They're to catch up crowds. to it. They're getting great oh, crowds. Oh, yeah. Well, it's great. Yeah, they and they, they've picked good markets like Miami, uh, Arizona. That, yeah. That's good markets for them to draw. I think it makes sense. Uh, it's a fun little added twist before the start of the MLB season. I would, you know, the only negative is there's so much stuff going on right now. I mean, yeah. we're about, we're, we're here in Orlando. We're about to give NCAA tournament hosting the first couple of rounds. So, uh, yeah, with, you know, with March Madness going on, you got NBA kind of hitting the stretch here before the playoffs, hockey play. So it doesn't get a lot of attention, but, uh, I do enjoy started. 
free yeah. NFL free agency. Maybe Aaron Rodgers will actually make a decision between this the, the, by the time this decade. Maybe and, not. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so it's a lot of stuff that baseball is going up. But it's good to see UCF guys involved well, in Darnell. I always like Darnell. I always like yeah. Darnell. He was a big part of that team. And I'm ha- I like Colton as well. Uh, we definitely miss Colton Gordon right now and our staff over here. Yeah. We miss you, Colton. Yeah. Have you guys seen what Great Britain's home run celebration is? It's kind of funny. No, they, no, uh, I haven't seen it. No, I saw those ugly uniforms they had, though. That yeah, for... but, yeah, they, they'll they give the guy, like, once he gets back to the dugout, they'll give him, like, a crown and a cape, and then they'll pull out a fake sword and knight him. <laughs> That's yeah. fantastic. That is it. That makes up for the uniforms that look like they were homemade and actually have punctuation, like a period after yeah. Britain. Did you see that? Like, no. oh, man. Anyway, uh, one thing we don't have to worry about, though, uh, is, it. well, <laughs> we, we can talk about the noteworthiness of uniforms another time. But, Nick Porcelli, we got to talk a little XFL because uh, you and I, once again, were at the Orlando Guardians this past week. Bummer that they are off to a bad start at 0-4, but... Uh, if you're a UCF fan, it was fun seeing Terrence Plummer out there this past weekend uh, against the Houston Rucknecks because he did the little pregame address to the fans, which which was really was cool. Great. That was great. He's, he's the team guy. He's fantastic. Like t- like Terrence, like that's classic Terrence Plummer, and had a really good game against oh, yeah. Houston. And he's been playing well so far this year, no? Yeah, uh, he had. Four solo tackles and three assisted tackles. Uh, combined, he had the most out, out of the entire team. So, yeah, it, like it just felt like he was all over the field that night. So, he did, yeah. he did a good game. Yeah. And, and uh, you know, we've seen – and you've got your XFL article coming up pretty soon here. Uh, Adrian Killen's obviously still out there uh, yeah. for the Arlington Renegades as a kick returner. I haven't seen him much doing much of anything else, but, you know, yeah. I mean, Adrian is a kick returner. He, yeah, he was kind of quiet in his game. They, he only got one. I don't know if he got hurt or something in the St. Louis game. But as for the runs, he only had like one handoff and he got zero yards. So kind of a quiet game for him this week. Yeah. And then we're also, also we haven't seen Rennell Hall yet. So we're hoping that he gets back from injury pretty yeah, soon. Yeah. Him and Jordan, um, hit him and Jordan, Jordan McCray. Although, you know, he plays linemen. So it's kind of, even when he does come back, it's kind of quiet. It's kind of hard to find stuff on him. But right. Right. So, but nonetheless, you know, we still wait, but well, listen, something's got to give this weekend because we have the guardians at 0 four going out to Las Vegas to play the Vegas Vipers. It's, take full time. it's formerly, take- formerly in Tampa Bay. So maybe a little, a, a, a uh, sort of second degree of war on I four flavor here. Okay. Maybe. And something's got to give. Right. I mean, you saw the tank. Well, what are they really tanking for? Number one draft pick? No, they're not tanking these guys. Come on. They're they're at least. You know, these guys are competitors, man. They're, they're you know, they come yeah, out think, with come out with a W. I make fun of it, but I still enjoy watching it. Like we, we've talked about this before. It's just nice to see these guys get like another chance just to play. It's guys who love football and I like yeah. watching that. Yeah. And it's fun to watch Terrence I, it, out there. He's been he's, he's flying around the ball. Um, yeah. I think he had a sack. We had a few pressures, I think, the other night, too. Uh, I, his stats don't say he had a sack, but I remember him pressuring the quarterback a lot. That yeah, night, he was, so. he's been around in the backfield. So, um, you know, but you never know. You yeah. just never know when when things might might turn for Terrell Buckley and the crew. So hopefully they get a W this week in Vegas. Yeah. Uh, we'll and home soon. You never know. Yeah, we need a home. We need a home win in the I worst. I want a home win. I know. We, we got to get one. We that player interview after the game, and it just never got to get one. We got to get one, man. So, yeah. all right. Uh, and then Bryson with a note on the uh, Bogdan Pavel breaking a uh, NCAA men's, te- or, or excuse me, UCF men's tennis record. Most doubles wins in program history. So, congrats to Bogdan on that um, as well. All right. We are going to wrap it up here on the Black and Gold Banneret podcast. Just a quick one for us, but we wanted to get this out because we got the NCAAs coming up. Uh, Eric, how about Duke and UVA coming to town here in Orlando? So that's going to be go. fun. Oh, let's we go. Got- we got San Diego State, College yeah. of Charleston there, which a lot of people like. Duke and Oral Roberts. You got the Louisiana Ragin' Cajuns against yep. Tennessee. That's a good uh, little pod we got here in Danny Orlando. Danny White and Tennessee coming Danny to Danny White will be in town Thursday watching the Tennessee there. And, of course, don't Orlando. forget NIT Wednesday night, ESPN2. Well, Thank you for scheduling that on Wednesday, by the way. And IT, thank you. We did that. That works out perfectly because even if I think if they win, I don't know what the semis would look like, but they'll probably play like Friday or Saturday. But 
Uh, I'm glad that does not conflict with Thursday because you and I will be in that building for, well, the whole day and night. Yep. Yep. We're going to be busy. So. Are you taking a nap? Are you going to just sleep there? You're going to just, you got a place to. Like, no, no. I, I Listen, it's also my son's birthday week. So, oh. so we're going to celebrate. We got St. Patty's day. He was born. It, it, he was born. I, we can't celebrate Thursday, but we're going to celebrate Friday. Saturday night, we got the two games. I'm doing I'm doing PA for all four games in the Amway Center on Thursday and, and both of them on Saturday. So it's going to be busy, but it's going to be fun. And, hey, like you said, you never know. Hey, UCF beats Florida. UC Irvine beats Oregon. We might have one more home game. Wow. At UCF at, 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 uh, one can hope. At addition, at addition Arena. So you never know. All right. So thanks to everyone for, uh, for watching and listening. Thanks to you. If you uh, subscribe to our podcast, we thank you. Leave us a rating. If not, please subscribe. Uh, we are on wherever you get your podcasts, be it Apple or Android devices. You can follow us each individually. I'm at Jeff underscore Sharon. Eric is at Eric Lopez Elo. Bryce is at It's Bryce and Turner. Nick is at Nick Porcelli in the number two. Also, don't forget Andrew at Stat Boy Drew and Kyle uh, at uh, the SOTT for the student to the game. And Noah Goldberg, the Noah Goldberg as well. Don't forget... Bryson's got his nightcap up, uh, taking care of uh, golf and tennis news that you might want to keep an eye on, as well as the baseball recap from this past weekend. A little bit more detail, plenty of post-game interviews from players and coaches alike as well. You can follow us collectively at UCF Banner at underscore SBN. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel as well, where you get all the latest post-game interviews from UCF baseball, softball, you name it, we are there. Here at Black and Gold Fan that. For Eric, for Bryson, for Nick, I'm Jeff. Thanks for watching and thanks for listening. Thanks for watching? No, thanks for listening. This has been the Black and Gold Banner Podcast. Go Knights! Beat Florida! <laughs> <laughs>